Welcome back to Role Models with me, Rich Crowley. Today's guest told me, if you read it, don't write it. Iterate onto it. You know, what are you adding to the conversation? Stephen Moore is a top writer across Medium. He's the editor of Postgrad Survival Guide. He's also the co-founder of Roots Furniture in Dundee, Scotland. So he's a bit of a triple threat and he writes with such rawness that you know everyone can relate to it so this was m more of a conversation just with a friend a peer and even with myself can we talk about meditation do you meditate where do you meditate do you have a cushion is it comfortable do you love it these were questions i at one point asked myself um, when i'm trying to form this practice and make it a habit rather than just uh, something i do every couple days you know how can i do it every day creating and setting up a space was the key for me and half moon yoga and meditation their products their cushions their zabiton is the reason i'm able to have that now and i invited them to be part of this show and believe in what we're building here and they graciously accepted that so i'm so thankful to them and golden root turmeric latte mixes curcumin have you heard of this do you know about the health promoting properties inside this ingredient curcumin which is part of turmeric if not check it out it is wildly healthy anti-inflammatory and these powders that golden root has created are caffeine free and sugar free so they give you that flavorful beverage no jitter no caffeine dependency you can go to sleep at night they're soothing and they're just tastier than water so thank you golden root thank you half moon thank you steven and thank you for checking this out Let's go hear what else this man has to say. I am uh, I'm excited to to dig into everything that you've been doing. I, I really admire like watching you grow recently having communication with you via email. I think I hunted you down a couple months ago, basically begging and say, hey, will you please publish something of mine in Postgrad Survival Guide? And I've just tried to relentlessly follow up via email and you've been such a gracious correspondent there. But this episode is all about you and what you've built. So I wanna start with your writing history. Discovering you, it's, you've been writing for a while, but you've also founded this company on the side. So when did you start writing and when did it start, you know, picking up steam for you? Okay, so um, I started writing as process to vent about starting a business. <laughs> so it kind of accidentally became the same thing. Um, because I... I kind of got fed up with seeing all the posts, you know, how how easy it is to be a successful founder, you know, business is as easy as, you know, get up at 5 a.m. and have a cold shower. So I started to write kind of, uh, I was trying to be the truthful side, quote unquote, of starting a business. No so it was, it was never an intention to be a writer at all, if I'll be honest. Um, it kind of just accidentally merged into the same. And when did, so when did you, it, it, it change from, I'm going to share my entrepreneur journey into, oh, I can write, people engage in, with what I write and want to read more. So when did you start expanding what you were writing about? Uh, that's a good question. So I'd say maybe 2019. I started to see that there was more to uh, sort of writing than just startups, small business. And uh, to be honest, I started to get a bit burnt out by, you know, that kind of, there's only so many things you can say about uh, you know, running a business. Um, but I think I joined a mentor group, like a mastermind group, and um, they encouraged me a lot to branch out more. You know, I was very embarrassed about, oh, I don't want to, write about my relationship and then they say to me well you know you have a 10-year relationship with the same person you know you clearly have an idea of how to be in a relationship 
And so they were like, you know, I think you could offer advice. And I think the first time I ever wrote about relationships, it's still one of my most successful pieces to this day. And that was kind of like the thing in my head, like, all oh, right, like people will listen to more than just what I think I know about. When, you know, like, when you first published a more personal piece, beyond the encouragement from your mentorship group, was there anything else that switched inside of you that made you a bit more comfortable sharing the more personal, the intimate story with the world? I think it was actually the response to it because I never actually considered that my family, my friends would read it. Like before it was so business orientated, I just assumed that nobody cared. But the moment I started to write about somebody that my friends knew, obviously my fiance, they know her, they know me. I never considered when I shared it on Facebook or LinkedIn that, oh wait, people know who I'm talking about. And this is a side of me that people actually know. I mean, I kind of thought, oh, my mom's going to read this, you know, my dad's going to read this. And I think once you do it once, you kind of, you stop caring. You know, once you've put yourself out there once and people go, oh, cool, he writes. And that's it. You know, there's no, no one scrutinizes your work or, yeah. and then you kind of think, okay, I can, you know, I can open up a bit more and people are actually going to embrace that from me. And where, where were you sharing that writing? So when you say putting it out there, where would you be distributing these early pieces? Mainly medium and then sort of my personal Facebook account. And I had a, a semi email list, like I had emails, but I didn't really have a strategy for engaging with them mm -hmm. as such. So that would be my process, just be medium, quick Facebook share, and then um, a quick share on my email list. But I think it was actually the Facebook thing that opened my eyes because all of a sudden my friends were commenting Oh, you're right, which kind of made me think they never bothered with the business stuff before, which is fair enough. You know, it's a bit more niche, isn't it? So, And you've grown that audience, what started with friends and family and some rogue emails. You've grown that to just alone on Medium, close to 10,000. You have your email list, your other social channels. How did you do it? Like, how did you grow from friends and family? to thousands and close to five digits of people who are consistently reading your work? Hmm. I think uh, very unglamorously, it's just lots of work. And I'm not I'm embarrassed to admit that I've definitely bailed out on writing a couple of times over. I think it says in my Medium account, I've been a member since 2017, I think. Um, but there's spells in there where I've ducked out and um, I think just lots and lots of time. I have no secrets, um, unfortunately, to audience building. I think it's just been a process of trial and error and uh, and sort of accepting that everything on the platforms you write on, it's all cycles. You know, there's, there's spells where you can write a listicle and it's guaranteed success, and then two months later, listicles are out, and it's now all about, you know, personal stories. So then you start writing personal stories, and then nobody wants to read personal stories. I think um, it's just been a long process. I must admit it was easier in the early days. I think I got from zero to a thousand by just plugging away at medium very fast. And then sort of by the time I've got into the low thousands, it's just been a very slow mm -hmm. process of, you know, maybe five to 10 followers a day. This it is what it is. So you, you've, written, you've written business pieces, you've written a listicle, you've written personal relationship. Within the structure of your writing, are there certain markers or signals that a reader recognizes you in? You know, is there, a, like, is there something that is a true beacon of your writing? Um, I've always liked to think it's my tone. But I'm not sure I could prove if that's correct or not. But I always, when I started doing the business stuff, I always thought about, like, I could go from the more, you know, like, try not to bullshit people angle and just go all in on, like, here's how it actually is. 
bit, maybe a wee bit negative, but um, I think I've always just tried to keep that kind of tone that, like, there's no fancy words, there's no, you know, I don't use strange expressions or I don't very, I don't quote people very often. It's just more like, here's my story and then here's lessons within said story. When you when you're editing, do you read your pieces out loud or perform them? How do you make sure that your tone is captured in the text? Um, that's a good point. I used to uh, I used to have an app that read the story back to me in kind of like a Microsoft Sam voice, you know, like a very old school computer voice. So you don't really get tone in there. But um, I think a huge point is. Uh, peer feedback like I've got a group of people and my work goes to them well work that I'm unsure about goes to them and they immediately call me out if it's like you know that doesn't sound like you or you don't write like that or you're trying too hard here you know blah blah so I think that's a huge point is to have people around you who like understand your style or at least like your style and then they can sort of help guide you when because it's you everyone can get quite caught up in trying to change their style to fit what's, you know, what's going well on the platforms that they write on. And I is think there, you've got uh, Is there any anyway. suggestion that you could give to a writer on how to form that circle for peer review? Is it just sending an email and asking, hey, can you read this? Or what did you have to do to create that community? Mm, a lot of it, I think, is engaging on the platform. So we take Medium, I think, if there's people you do respect, then reach out on even comment on the pieces, highlight the pieces just enough that they can see your name kind of popping up. Or as you were joking about earlier, just send the email. And people people are surprisingly okay with you know responding. I took a call from someone the other day, and I had an hour later we were still talking, and it was just a brand new medium writer, twenty five wow. fans or something. Um, reached out to me through email like you, we swapped numbers and then, you know, I'm quite happy to reciprocate and give that call for an hour. So I think it's just, I think people put those writers on a pedestal a wee bit, you know, like, oh, Stephen and or Rick have got, you know, X followers, that's, they're never going to have any time for me. Mm -hmm. Like really, we're all, we're all just the same, aren't we? We're all just sitting in front of a computer. Yeah. Tapping away on the keyboard, you know, phones right next to us. So, I think it's just been having a bit of courage just to, you know, shoot the email out and see what happens. When you're not at the computer, but you are investing in yourself, do you have any types of practices that help you nourish your creativity or foster originality? And I've asked this question before, and for some people it's exercising before I write. Other people, it's a certain beverage, a nice warm tea. Other people, it's a certain time of day. Like, Are there certain things that you just – practices you have in your life that put you in the best position to write great stuff? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think you've touched on it maybe already, but the edit, as, as I do editing, I, I normally do the editing first. So I'm, mm. reading other people, I'm reading other people's work first thing in the day. Mm. And that can maybe take two to three hours. And then normally by then I have a break and then it's my turn. So I'm probably alive and kicking four or five hours before I've thought about what I'm going to write. So I guess I give my brain quite a lot of time to slowly wake up. I've caught thoughts on what other people have sent to me. I've maybe reviewed some, you know, uh, given feedback to someone's, work in this mastermind group so i've done all that first so i think maybe even subconsciously that's just my brain taking in everything and then i get going mm -hmm. but i don't i don't necessarily have any practices to bring it right and my writing is very sporadic there's days i could write four pieces and four days in a row where i write no pieces i get a bit i'm very much just go with the flow and you You've laid out this very humanized framework of what it's like to be a writer. You know, you, you said 
we're all the same. You know, we're all in front of a computer. We're all at a keyboard. Um, before we dive into some of the specifics of your writing, a question for every writer, it seems to be top of mind on Medium is, do you write for money? Is it okay to say, yeah, I write for money? Where do you stand on this statement or the, this question debate? Um, in the middle, I think. I think it's entirely okay to write for money, but I think everyone who started without that intention is in a better place. So for like example, I started a medium before you could even make money. It didn't exist. That's I think a lot. Yeah, 2016, I think, is the first time I wrote something on Medium. Wow. And how and, was, uh, what was that like when the partner program came and it said, hey, you can make some money now? I think I think everyone met it a bit skeptically at the start. It was like, yeah, sure. Everyone can make money. Yeah, okay. And then, you know, you get one month where there's like $2,000 in your account. And you're like, wow, like you can actually make money from mm -hmm. Medium. And then... But the old way was more, I think people who were on it at the start, it was more just, there was more people on there just trying to share a message or, or, you know, their message. Whereas I think now there is a lot of people that are on it to make money. Yeah. And that's what we, as we touched on earlier. Then they see, okay, listicles are cool. I'll write listicles. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or whatever style is cool. They go levitate towards and you can spot them really fast. And I think it's okay to be doing that, but anyone who was there before is in a better place, mm -hmm. in it's my a, opinion. You're, you're one of the pioneers then. Um, we'll, we'll call you, there should be a title for those who were pre-partner program on media. Stephen, I want to talk about your writing. And there's, there's a part of it that I really admire, which is the variety. And what it signals to me is that you are truly curating the reader's experience. You are not reacting to something that might be going viral, a trend, a fad. It's clear, hey, I want to write about when I was a rock star in high school. I want to write about the privilege of my quarantine. I want to write about building a million dollar business. This is stuff that you're interested in, in your writing. So, what is your true relationship to this? Do you ever feel pressure to kind of jump on a fad and a trend? Or like, how do you stay so disciplined and write within such alignment of your interests? Um, I think possibly because I have tried to follow trends before. And you find very quickly that you stop enjoying writing. And I think the moment you stop enjoying writing, you notice your quality of writing goes down, your output goes down. Mm -hmm. And then, as I say, I've taken a couple of stints where I've disappeared on Medium for four or five months and then kind of considered, ah, maybe I'm not cut out for that. And then I've come back. And then, and I think now, you know, 2016 to 2020, I've grown up a lot in those four years. And I think now I'm far more, just, I just understand more of what I'm about and what I want to out there and I've kind of long since stopped looking at stats and stopped worrying about oh that piece got 10 claps and that one got 40 claps you know let me analyze that I just don't bother anymore it's, uh, that's the kind of stuff that takes you down the rabbit hole and you don't come you don't come back out of those kind of things you know so I just you know I've just learned to focus more on me now than before how did you get to that point how did you overcome the habit of being the refresh rabbit for stats to someone who is able to just walk away and resist clicking into stats and analyzing them? Um, I think because you, you get quite, uh, maybe not upset, but, you know, I've, I've had times where, you know, I've been quite down about the returns on, my writing and I think you have to just come to a point where you realize if you keep following that that's what's going to turn you off from writing at all and I think you've just got to realize that you know stats are quite toxic and, and they, they 
I quite easily push you away from writing altogether. And that's just what I came, I just come to terms with that now. I think that, you know, you see all these Facebook groups and everyone's just posting their stats and trying to microanalyze why somebody got 12 views and five cents and someone got 14 views and eight cents. And it just there's just no point in going in circles about any of that. And I think the moment you can separate yourself from that, as you were mentioning, like the rock star piece, I would never have written that a year ago. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And now I just think like, oh, I've got some funny stories to tell. I've got some insightful lessons to share. And they'll resonate with somebody. And I've had more fun writing those kind of pieces than I've had ever probably writing on Medium. So, I am, I'm sobered by your response because I have invested, or I'll say wasted hours trying to understand an algorithm. And I know where it stems from within me. And it's never gonna change how I write or what I write about. It just changes my relationship to a piece of writing where where I wanna be as a writer is, did I love that piece of writing? the moment before I pressed publish? If yes, then that's it. That is fulfillment, that is success. Whatever happens when someone else has my words, post publish, to be okay with that. So you're, you're not the first to remind me of that, but it's one of the strongest responses I've heard and I'm, I'm thankful for that. In, in the half decade that you've been publishing on Medium, I do, you, send old. <laughs> do you have a favorite piece that you've ever published? Wow. Um, I would actually say that relationship piece that I wrote, so that would be um, summer of 2019, I think, just because that was the one that set the path for how I've written since. Like that was the one that kind of unlocked the door. And I was like, you know, okay, I can write about basically anything. And people don't look at me like, you know, how does he know relationships? Or how can he talk about productivity? Or, you know, how can he, whatever. Like, that mm-hmm. kind of was the penny drop. So, okay. I can move away from startups and just write as I please. It sounds like that was your permission piece the one that signaled yeah, totally. to you, hey, go for it. And you, you asked you the role of a friend saying, hey, who's he to write about relationships? Why, did, why can he write about that? And reading your words, your tone, the subject matter of it, you are incredibly thoughtful and educated on everything you write about, but it's relatable. And you, you write at this peer-to-peer level as if you were texting a friend, hey, hey, here, here are some nice hacks or things you can do in your morning. Hey, here's what a relationship is like. Hey, here's something you can do in business. It's not preachy. It's not penalty box. It's not soapbox. And relatability is something in writing that I do think yields in organic growth, which you've seen. You, you've bear, borne the fruits of that. Um, so congratulations for that, first of all, and, and becoming that writer. For for young writers, for new writers, for you in 2016, new to medium, what advice do you have for that level of writer? They just signed up for medium after hearing you on this video. Um, read, read before you write. <laughs> Like, read, read on the platform before you write, because I think, you know, like, my dad has a journalistic background, and my dad would look at what I write and not necessarily deem it as, you know, quote-unquote, good writing, you know, but then it's suitable for a medium as a platform. Mm, so I true. think the first thing people should do is read on the platform, get a gauge for what the, what the better writers are doing. But then, as we've already touched on, then don't copy that. You know, then you still got to find your own style, your own tone. I've always said to people, you know, if you've read it before, 
don't write it. And that's not obviously a blanket rule. You can write it, but you have to be adding something to it. Mm-hmm. You know, what's your what's your unique take? What's your insightful opinion? What's your different lesson on the said topic? Because we are all writing about the same things. There's only so many times you can write about how to have a productive morning. But if you've got something new to say about that, then there's space for your piece, you know, to be to be out there. And I think that's a huge thing. I want to I want to quote you for Uh-oh. in a response to this question. And you wrote newsflash. If you think there's a hack to becoming a great writer, you are in for a shock. Sure, there are countless tips and tricks that will help you improve your writing such as headline hacks, storytelling techniques, formatting and style guides. I've used many of them myself to fine tune my process and output, but none of them is a substitute for hard work. And this was from your piece titled, There's No Hack to Becoming a Good Writer. And you've also written that there's nothing worse in the world than lazy talent. And it's it's, it's a redundant theme of our conversation where, you know, yeah, small little things might move the needle, but putting in the time, putting in the time to read and understand the platform to like reading is a way to build that skill as is writing, write more, give yourself permission to share and have a bit of this fearless approach to it. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, that um, excerpt from your piece? No, I think, I mean, I think uh, as you've mentioned, I'm kind of like a good example of that. Like I've, no matter what I've, I tried in my early years, it has taken three years and to still well, not be at, but you know, 10,000 followers, for example, like should be a good indicator to anyone that this is, unless you're one of those really lucky people, there's no, there's no quick fix. And I think even like, if you take sort of that line of the lazy talent, you look at guys like on the platform, like Tim Denon or Nicholas Koki or whatever, people can look at those guys and think, well, you know, they've got X thousand followers, you know, blah, blah, they've made it. These guys still put out one, two things every day. Mm-hmm. You know, like they, that's why their talent has got them to the level they are. And there's no doubt writers that are better than those guys, but they don't work as hard. Mm-hmm. That's a really, that last line, that there, there may be better writers. There are better writers. There will be, yeah. yeah. But hard work is going to come in and most of the time it's going to create and surface your let you rise to the top. Let's switch gears for the end of this conversation. You are an editor at one of the top publications. It's called the Postgrad Survival Guide. It's the millennial career and life advice publication. When did you join? What does that duty look like? But more importantly, what advice from an editor do you have to a submitting writer? Okay, so that journey for me started uh, 2019 in January. And Tom reached out to me because I was the one the, involved in this, this writing group. I think I was the, one of the first students ever to take Tom's course. And then um, I then became part of a Slack group associated with the course. And then slowly mm-hmm. but surely, you know, built up a relationship with Tom. And then Tom reached out at the start of 2019 to sort of come on board. And it's been a long journey. At the start, I was just publishing everything that came my way as I was instructed to. And then we actually met each other in the summer of 2019 in Barcelona. And meeting him in person, we kind of came up with a business plan of sorts. And since then, we've sort of like tripled the views of the publication. We've got like huge writers on board, and um, yeah, we're kind of now starting to look what's outside of the course too. We're looking at building our own products associated with the brand, etc. But um, my daily goal uh, is really I just work into the submissions, and then I also look through. I actually saw you just posted a piece about self-publishing. And I actually look through all the topics every day, self mindfulness, work, and reach out to anyone who's self published a curated piece. And if it's suitable for the publication, you know, I offer to bring that across. 
but yeah, that's my job really. I'm solely focused on the publication, and then Tom kind of works on the um, bigger brand, the bigger mm-hmm. picture of the of the project. So, would you would you encourage someone to open their own publication? Mm, maybe it depends how niche maybe the publication is going to be because mm-hmm. I think a lot of the categories are completely there's no room for you know more self-help or I think there's enough writing publications mm-hmm. so I think if you have a very niche concept I think there's room for a publication and I know a lot of writers like Shannon Ashley for example like to have their own publications for their own work but it just yeah. allows their it just allows the followers to see stuff under certain categories yeah I, I, don't, write, I don't write enough for that so I know that Shannon does that I believe Gillian Sisley does that and some other writers and it's had me thinking you know it's there's pros and cons because submitting to a publication there's the ego feed where it's validating when you get accepted. But there's also, hey, there's a professional editor who's going to read your work and offer suggestions and make sure this is the best representation of your words possible. When you self-publish, you're the sole editor. So it's like it all falls on your shoulders, but you have a bit more creative freedom. You can infinite backlinks, include the link to your newsletter. So. I go back and forth and that, that that piece I wrote was, you know, I studied two articles. It's like to really come to like a harder conclusion, I have to repeat this exercise. I have to repeat it every week or every month to really understand, but add on to that too, some publications are 100% worth it because like you guys and like Nick's at Better Marketing or like the startup, Entrepreneur's Handbook, medium owned ones, they push it out and they return members to you but another publication that doesn't really share it, it's not as important. It's just like, hey, it's you actually become lead gen for that publication. So it's, you know, it's as, it has equally as much equity on medium conversations as does the, hey, is it okay to write for money type piece? Stephen, thank you. Pick, oh, I'm sorry, I was just to pick up on your point of uh, advice to people submitting. I think the biggest thing is to, you know, read the guidelines or style guidelines for the publication. Yeah. It seems like a small thing, but the amount of content that comes in that's entirely unrelated to a publication. And then you've kind of, you've not got many chances to build a rapport with an editor. You Mm -hmm. know, if you send two or three things that don't fit, then you're kind of looking at an editor's going to start recognizing your name and just, you know, being like, oh, you know, him or her again. Yeah. So, you know, you've really got to make sure when you submit, you know, your following style guides, topic guides. Mm-hmm. And I think as well, just be respectful of editors. Like I'm a one man team. I do this. So, you know, people can message you after two days and be like, you know, hey, what's happening? And I'd be like, I've not even got anywhere near their piece yet. So. So if I submit something to you in an hour, you don't want me to follow up tonight and say, hey, have you read it? And then again tomorrow morning, have you read no, it? Maybe. I may make exception for you. <laughs> um, I think that's, yeah. Uh, editors deserve public recognition for how busy they are and how much brain space it takes to edit a piece and really look over submissions because it can't be casual. You're looking for, is this a fit? You're looking for grammar. You're looking for style. Um, so thank you for the behind the scenes work you're doing there. Before I let you go, uh, what's next? What are you working on? What's next for you? What are you incubating in your mind that we can look forward to you sharing at some point in the future? Well, very appropriately, I'm working on a book that will be aimed at new writers or new writers navigating the online world. Amazing. And I'm kind of like at pitching stage. Like I have a draft and I've got a kind of book pitch. So that's where I'm going. Congrats. 
So that's kind of this year's plan and really just focusing on the publication. We're really putting like a 2020 is going to be the year that we just solely focus on the postgrad publication. Wow. Congrats. And, then and, I, and, and um, thank you for, for everything you're doing for writers like myself, for every other writer on the platform. You're giving them the opportunity to up level their work and be in a really recognized and respected publication. So, what you and Tom have done, um, we as writers, I'll speak for everyone, I guess, but we're, we're, we're incredibly grateful. Now, where can we follow you? I know you have a Substack newsletter. Um, where's the best place to go check out all of your work? Yeah, I think uh, just uh, either Medium, I think my tag is like uh, at SJM Moore, and then you'll find my Substack channel on there. Okay. I also have a, a, a website of www.sjmblog.com. Awesome. I'll make sure to include all of those. When this goes live, I'm opening up a publication just for the rough draft. So all the videos, and I think it's an easy way for me to link all your medium stories and backlink to your website and social media. So I'll make sure that I include everything there. But thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday night. I know you're a couple hours ahead of me. Uh, just across the Atlantic. So I look forward to editing this, to using it as a resource to share with other writers. And I'm excited to just keep following and keep reading what you're putting out and eventually read that book. Nice one. I look forward to your next submission to the publication. <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs>